Hi everyone, uh, thanks very much for the introduction, Francesco. Um, yeah, as I said, I'm doing a PhD at ATH and pretty much working on applied machine learning and optimization in the domain of traffic engineering. And one topic we are working on, uh, which we thought would be really simple, but it turned out to be not that simple, um, is predicting the time to green. Um, and we do this for fully actuated signal control systems and apply machine learning. So time to green basically means, simple as it sounds, a traffic light is green, uh, eyes turning red, how, does it, how long does it stay red? So time until it turns green again. And to shade a bit light into that, why this is actually interesting and why it's not so simple as it might sound, um, here's a short motivation. So actually also in Switzerland, people were thinking of implementing these here. So you might have seen it in the US and I mean, the concept is pretty simple. It's a simple countdown uh, of the time to green, right? And actually the social Democrats here, they wanted to implement this in, in, uh, in Switzerland but it got turned down then. And the main reason, this is in German, but what the main reason was is that these red and green phases, so the time duration of red and green is not constant. And this is due to the involvement of traffic control systems. So they get more flexible in terms of public transportation priority. Also, uh, they are coupled to the traffic demand that we are currently seeing. So it's, it, it, still, it still has not happened because we don't have these countdowns, right? Um, another motivation would be if we look a bit into the future and we focus on vehicle to infrastructure environments that we might get soon. Um, there is actually a protocol already standardized which is called signal phase and timing messages. So pretty much what that is that um, the infrastructure sends a package to the car where several information is in there and one part is the time to green actually. And why would that be helpful? So it could be beneficial for speed advisory systems so you can plan your motion planning, how such a vehicle is moving more efficiently and this would end up in more homogeneous traffic. And based on traffic flow theory, that's where we would really be happy about that. And not only, uh, we could already already use that now as well. So if you have an HMI in your vehicle that would be a speed advisory system that works nicely, why not? But this all boils down to one requirement, which is that we need a robust prediction of this time to green. So the problem definition, um, what are we looking at? And just to shade a bit light into signal control systems, because not everyone might be familiar what we already know and how we call this stuff, um, we have three types here. So non-actuated ones, semi-actuated and fully actuated ones. And pretty much where they differ is just the flexibility. So non-actuated obviously is just static. It doesn't react to anything at all. It just does its job. And fully flexible systems can react to traffic dynamics. So non-actuated case is pretty simple. Um, so we have a green time, we have a red time, yellow and red, yellow, we just uh, discard that for here now. And we have a cycle time. Cycle time pretty much means if a signal turns red and then it goes through green and turns red again, that's one cycle. Um, so in a non-actuated case, all of these constants are constant. So obviously a prediction, why should we do that? Because the city obviously knows uh, if it's red for 16 seconds always, it is what it is. Um, if we go to semi-actuated systems, the red and the green time actually can be flexible. So, but still they add up always to the same cycle time. So in this case here, 34 seconds, that's always the case, but in between these quantities, red and green, they can vary. And this comes in, uh, comes in nice or handy if you wanna give priority to public transportation. Because if we, if we check out uh, this part here, the green time here is longer than here, and this might be due to a bus coming, and then you just extend the green time. And this is much more, is more efficient. And here you, you can already predict um, the time to green, and that's what people have been doing in, in the literature for now. And you have the constraint that the cycle duration is fixed, which um, is a nice constraint you can use. And the last systems, obviously everything is flexible, so you can fully react to traffic dynamics, to public transportation, and um, obviously you don't have predefined constraints now anymore, so the time to green prediction um, must be more robust to what is happening in the system. Okay, 
So this is not something uh, that we just look at in research. So there are already systems that are also applied uh, in real life, and also here in Switzerland. Um, and this comes due to more sensor technology. So we get more advanced there. We have loop detectors. I mean, we have these already for a long time, but we also have Bluetooth sensors. For example, Zurich also has thermal cameras now, which helps us to detect traffic and use that information to uh, control it in a more efficient way. And then people, and this is mostly coming from the research side, but is already in practice, are developing optimization methods, for example, where you want to minimize the total travel delay in a certain perimeter or the waiting time. And for example, in Basel, uh, VS Plus is running, which is doing that in a nice way. And we also did an evaluation study in Lucerne where self-control was running, which is uh, from two academics from Switzerland. And we also could show, or they could show, and we could evaluate it, that this is uh, working nicely and is actually more efficient. Cycle times, green and red times, are not constant at all in these two systems, for example. And we need a prediction model that captures the variance um, of the target we want to predict. So if we look into the, what we can use as an input and wh what we want to predict, what we basically have here is that um, we have certain signals, S1, S2, until SI. We have the red and the green time of these. We have N cycles of these. So this is our input data. So we can collect this, all the cycle durations in a set uh, C. We have all the green times in a set G and R, all the red times. And what we are interested in then is for signal one, for example, we want to have the time to green one, uh, which is then obviously a function of the cycle n plus one of signal one. So this is the time span we don't know and that we want to predict. We don't care about the green time. Um, so pretty much this function f here, which takes all these concatenated inputs, which is this vector x here, uh, this should be provide us, this should be our model that allows us to predict this. Okay, what has happened so far? So research that is already published, uh, what we already know, people have done this with vehicle trajectories, but this is quite dem data demanding and uh, authorities also other um, companies, whatever they wanna apply this might not have this data available. Other people only consider traffic signal data, which is obviously not capturing a nonlinear relationship between detector data and traffic signal data and other people, as already said, have focused on fixed cycle times, which is a bit easier, so to speak. And what hasn't been considered so far is this consideration of public transportation dynamics, because they are a heavy influencer here of this quantity. So stating again, we want to predict the time to green for fully actuated signal control systems by not only just using traffic signal data, but also somehow mapping the detector data in there where we know what is happening in our system. Okay. So the study area we went to, so this was a nice collaboration with the city of Zurich. So we really went from the practical side where we got the data to the modeling side. And we did this in Zurich. So this is close to the main station in Zurich. And we took an intersection perimeter there where we have individual transport, where we also have the public transportation part, pedestrians and also cyclists. And obviously we took a fully actuated signal control system. So if you look a bit closer, um, all these numbers here with the, with the circles around are traffic signals. So we have 12 of these. And if we look, we also have a tram line here. So these lines, these verticals are signalizing the tram line. So we also have dedicated signals for these. And we get the data of all of these uh, traffic signals. Also, we want to include the detector data. So we also have the data for that. And these are these uh, rectangles and squares here. So we are lucky here um, because we can detect vehicles at almost every approach except here. We don't have one, but okay. So what we got from the city of Zurich is basically this. This is what they are using and where we started off. And this is, they call this telegram. So this is an event-based system where um, basically you get a telegram when something is happening, so a traffic light is changing a state or also a detector. And without going into much detail, it's pretty simple. You have a timestamp, um, you have a note ID, signal or detector identifier here, a device ID, and then you get the states which a traffic signal or a detector can take. So we took this data, we transformed it, and we also aggregated it. 
and we aggregated it to cycles because this makes sense uh, looking at this problem. Um, so for every traffic signal and every detector, and in this case we took Monday to Friday, so in the first step we left the weekends out, uh, which doesn't do too much harm, but what does is uh, traffic lights after eight o'clock, they might get switched off, and if they are yellow flashing, you don't get much data out of that, so you obviously exclude that. And then we compute the following feature set. So what we take obviously is red and green time. Um, the traffic flow at red and also at green, so separate what comes into our system depending on the traffic light state. We also compute the detector occupancy, which gives an indicator um, how often this detector during a signal phase was occupied, um, a congestion indicator and also a queue indicator. And these are basically just statically with thresholding saying if a detector is occupied longer than five seconds and the signal is actually green, this is an indicator for congestion. If it's red, it's occupied longer than X seconds, it's a queue. So we take this and that's our data set. And we can plot the features now. And so what we see here is signal four, which is just um, serving or controlling in that sense individual transportation and this signal here is for public transportation. And without uh, looking uh, on the y-axis um, where the mean is or whatever, what immediately pops into eye, we have really long tails here. And what you could do now is say, okay, um, I'm gonna use a smart um, approach to detect these outliers and I'm gonna remove them. But we did so, but we also had a look, why is this actually happening? So. Obviously, as you see with the long tails, we didn't remove them because these are some extreme events that we actually have. So it can happen that 150 seconds the traffic light is just red because um, public transportation was influencing that. So there were two trams coming and another one was coming. So these events are there. And obviously, if you want to have a sophisticated countdown, we also want to um, predict that. So, we use that and long tails, if you, look to, if you look into classification problems, there are long tail learning approaches, but with regression, as we have a regression problem here, um, there is not so much going on. So what we did in this case is that we said, we, we, we can use one property of this problem here. Um, and I'm gonna walk you through here. So we have this raw data and we did the data processing as before. So we compute our features, we data clean, and so on and so forth. And we have this input vector x. But now we actually know that, I mean, a red time that has occurred historically was also a green time, a time to green, right? Because if you predict the time to green of 30 seconds, this will be, we assume that we are correct, this is the red time um, of, the next, of the next sample, right? So the distribution of these two must be similar. And what we can do then is um, we look at the percentile i, as we call it here, of our input sample, I um, mean our input vector of the signal we want to predict. If this is then um, in this distribution here, so this is a signal i and this is the distribution we get, and we have two thresholds here, k and j, so two percentiles, we, we treat them as hyperparameters and we find the best ones. Uh, for a model which serves uh, for a traffic signal I. Um, if it's lower, then we go this path, obviously, and use the model low, so to speak, which was trained on this data. In the middle, we use that part, and in the long tail, we use that part. And depending, we're feeding then for every, for every if we want to predict 100 cycles, we look at every single input, we feed it to the, to the according model and then we stick, we put it together again, we have the time to green prediction for n cycles. So yes, if, so what we did in this case is we just threw a multilinear regression uh, in the first place it is to have some sort of benchmark, uh, random forest as well and then we applied the random forest with this distribution split as we call it. And as performance matrices we took the mean absolute error but not only. Uh, we took this because we also wanted to compare what is happening uh, or how good we are compared to the literature because most of the people simply use that. But we also would argue that the mean absolute error here can be quite intriguing, obviously, because if you just predict good uh, 
according to the mean, that doesn't mean that you capture the peaks or that you are actually um, doing good in some cases that might be unexpected. So we also define quite some strong uh, matrix here, so the exact hit, which really is when we are hitting the time to green, so we don't have an error at all, or a near miss where we say we state the requirement of having an error below one second. And yes, so some results here uh, of this work in progress, obviously. So if we just um, look at the time series in blue, which we want to predict, we can already see this fluctuates quite uh, heavily. And this is also an example which is quite um, challenging because every single peak you see here, and I chose this on purpose, is influenced by public transport. And we're gonna see at the end why this is a problem for predicting this. So the linear regression, I wouldn't argue that the model picks the pattern up nicely. Um, and also the mean absolute error here, I excluded a few for readability and also the other signals that are missing here are um, pedestrian signals. So they are co-regulated with the first five. So the error is obviously gonna be similar because they operate in the same way. And we can see that the uh, mean absolute error is below five seconds um, and the exact hit rate is quite low. And for this plot here, we can see 5% and quite not more or less 18% near misses. And if we go to the random forest, it already looks a bit nicer here. So we have still for the signal four, we have 4.5 seconds. Our exact hit rate is 6.6%, which is not so great. The near miss is 26%. Um, similar for all the other traffic signals. And if we finally apply this uh, distribution split, we actually can improve that um, quite nicely. So sorry, just to remember, we had 6.6% .6 for exact hit and 26 for near miss. And we move up to 47 and 62, which is quite good. But also this pattern here in the area of one standard deviation from the mean works quite nicely. But still, these peaks, they are not covered at all, and that's a problem, right? And this is something which is not, um, or which has a reason, and the reason for that is pretty much something that, yeah, we should have thought earlier, I would say, but um, it's quite obvious in traffic what happens. So we predict the time to green, and this is also a natural problem. So you predict something, and then something, uh, the unexpected happened, right? And this is uh, the case here because we predicted the time to green and then a tram comes and the, green, the red time which we predicted was 30 seconds and this might have been true, but then it gets extended. So you are applying to that. So obviously what we are currently doing is adding another block to this framework that pretty much gives the model a probability of how likely it is that there is a tram coming and um, first results look quite prom promising uh, in terms of that. Okay, so conclusion and future work. What we are currently doing is, our, what we have is a, a framework for this to predict the time to green, um, capturing the non relationship by merging together traffic signal data and also detector data. And future work is um, what I just mentioned, that you also infer these uh, public transport detections in a nicer way that you are not blind to that and obviously comparing them to other models which are quite promising here like the XG Boost or LSDM where we have some first results and it looks quite promising but the last issue I mentioned remains the same. Um, and we also have data from the uh, evaluation pilot I mentioned in Lucerne so we can also try that because the variance of these quantities is um, much higher with this optimization signal control approach where we have also data from that. And with that, thanks very much. I'm happy to answer your questions. Any question for Alex? Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. It's very interesting. I have two questions about your model. One is, um, how is your model performance sensi uh, sensitivity to the uh, uh, percentiles you setting for the upper bound and the lower bound? I noticed that you uh, uh, treat the three models for different uh, percentile range. 
So whether your performance, I'm curious whether your performance is sensitive to this setting. Yes, uh, so that's the it, first question. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, it, it definitely is. So I mean, what we what we first did is we just selected, for example, you look at one signal distribution, you might think, yeah, percentile 20 and 70 might work, but that might be completely off for another signal with such a di di different distribution. So what we do is we treat these as hyperparameters. So we actually have minimizing the exact, or maximizing the max hits, or maximizing the near misses, or minimizing the mean absolute error, and we find the best percentiles for a traffic signal. And as we have one model for one traffic signal for now, uh, we can find the optimal ones there, and we have these hyperparameters that, um, depending on what, uh, you, what your check function is, might work best. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and another question is, um, um, sometimes I, it's very struggle to have the uh, distribution, distribution estimation in advanced. Um, if we have not uh, prior understanding of the distribution, the actual distribution of the traffic data, how can we, uh, uh, I'm curious, how can we apply this kind of uh, uh, model to, to to this situation, or uh, I'm not sure whether it mm -hmm. is uh, applicable to your questions. Your so basic, basically you mean, because what I have now is historical data, so I can look at it and say, this looks like a log normal or whatever, and can uh, assume that, or I have the actual distribution. And you mean if, if I don't have that at all, what do I assume then? Um, well, yeah, actually, Good question. I, I I only have looked at that data so far, so um, I mean, something with a long tail uh, should represent it quite nicely, right? But this is um, heavily dependent how what the rules, because we treat the signal control system as a black box, right? And we want to learn how it works, reverse engineer it, if you want to put it like that. So I would argue that distributions here could look quite differently. Um, the long tail I would expect, um, but what is happening on the other side or how the, the mean and the variance looks, uh, I, I would say quite hard. Uh, you could just assume something, but I, I, I wouldn't expect the best performance then. Um, but long tail is something that definitely will occur here. Uh, cool, thank you, thank you for your answer. Any more question for Alex? Uh, thank you. you. You talked about the, the distribution, and do you have any feeling about the, what that distribution changes over time, like in rush hour and stuff like that? Is that also in included here in your predictions, like that the distribution of long, like the long tail might only be in the rush hour, but not so much in the other times? Yeah, yeah definitely. So, I mean, that's, that's for now is for the whole day and for two weeks, so everything is in there. Uh, but definitely the, the long tail is something that occurs uh, in the rush hour because there you also have the problem that, I mean, the timetable of, tr of the tram in this case is more frequent. Um, and then you might also, I don't know, you call it bus bunching. I don't know if the tram bunching is a thing, but uh, you, that also might occur. Uh, so the, 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 I also looked at that and this is a peak hour phenomenon uh, that might that disappears and also makes the distribution of peak looks much nicer uh, and also easier. And I mean, I could have showed results where I just take that away and then the prediction also works quite nicely. But I think this is really something we, we need to tackle uh, to have a system that not only runs and gets switched off if or the countdown goes to zero and then just disappears. And I think the acceptance of such a system wouldn't be that great then. Thank you. Any last comment? If not, I have one for you. So you're predicting the immediate next green or red. Would you be able to predict the next next, kind of to make peaceful the people that are waiting there, say, look, it's gonna take three minutes or not? So let's say, can you predict a bit further right in the future? If you have a flow probably that's constant over, I don't know, five minutes or so, right? If you have a large queue and so on. So would you 
see any interest there or any possibility from your data and or approach? So, I mean, uh, obviously, so as you just said, if you have constant flows, that's, that's an important thing. So, because you, you have to assume something there and you also have to be, uh, take into account that the error uh, propagates, right? But this could be something in, in practice. Um, I don't know if that's so useful. Uh, for speed advisory systems, I mean, they also probably arriving uh, one cycle before, but definitely something interesting, or just to see how the error propagates. But what we're having right now, I can definitely say with confidence that the error propagates uh, in a bad way. <laughs> Wonderful. Then uh, let's uh, thank Alex for this uh, refreshing idea about uh, signals.